welcome all to our uh, third talk in the series called History of Medicine. So I just wanted to give you a brief introduction of why we started this series and I realized that most of our talks are about the person's own work in great detail and in really uh, great knowledge being imparted as a result of it. Uh, but really when you think about a topic, many of us really don't know what the inception of that topic was, what was it that caused that question to be arisen and for people throughout the millennia to be addressing it and what state of art, the art is it at this point in time. So I in, uh, invited some great luminaries uh, to give us uh, their insight and their vision of the history of their topic of their expertise and today's speaker is Dr. Ralph Ruban and it gives me great pleasure and it's an honor to introduce you Ralph. I have known Ralph ever since I have come here 24 years ago now, believe it or not. Um, and he is uh, the professor of pathology and oncology and at present the chair of pathology. So he's a, he has really built a great reputation on, in pancreatic pathology as an expert and his areas of clinical expertise include pancreatic cancer and most importantly the definition of its precursor neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas and pancreatic pathology. So uh, in much of his research uh, it was the characterization of pan-ins or pancreatic uh, uh, um, intra epithelial neoplasias and these are the precursor lesions that give rise to invasive pancreatic cancer. He is the Baxley Professor and Director and, uh, of the Department of Pathology. He also serves as the Director of the Sol Goldman Pancreatic Cancer Research Center at Hopkins and is a member of the Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center. Um, I have known uh, Ralph ever since his days in, in uh, Bert Vogelstein and, and uh, Scott Kern and all the collaborations that were done it as early as 2002, right? And uh, seminal papers came out from the laboratory describing the molecular basis of pancreatic cancer by SAGE analysis and so forth. Uh, as a result, of course, lots and lots of markers for pancreatic cancer were discovered and characterized by his laboratory and his collaborators. He has, as a result, authored more than 700 peer-reviewed manuscripts and five books and including a standard textbook on pancreatic pathology. And I was very impressed by the fact that he's really up, up to date in terms of technology because he has an award-winning iPad application to teach pancreas pathology. And this is called the Johns Hopkins Atlas of Pancreatic Pathology. And an iPad, an iPhone app for patients with pancreatic cancer. This is called the iCare book. And he's also produced an award-winning documentary on the life of William Stewart, Stewart Halstead, Hopkins' first surgeon-in-chief. So this interest in pathology is not, has, is not arisen just because I asked him to give this talk, but this is a long-standing interest of Ralph. And who better to talk to us today about pancre pancreas and pancreatic cancer than Ralph. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for taking time from your lunch to hear a little bit of uh, history. Um, this is a brief outline of what I hope to talk about uh, this afternoon, and really to emphasize that since uh, the, its beginning in, in Europe and Asia, scientific medicine has been marked by profound transformative waves uh, of, of innovation that have fundamentally changed the field and they change the way we conceive of an entire field. And I think you'll see that with pancreatic cancer. I'll emphasize that Johns Hopkins School of Medicine opened in 1893, and in the 20th century, the epicenter of medicine moved from Europe to the United States, in large part because of Hopkins. I'll then uh, talk about Hopkins as a leader in the field of pancreatic cancer research, and uh, much because of some people in this room. And I'll leave everyone with a challenge that today we have the opportunity to rejuvenate the precision medicine of the first chairman of medicine here at Johns Hopkins, William Osler. So where does medicine, scientific medicine all start? It, and, and Nick Papadopoulos is here so he can uh, correct me on my geography, but on this small uh, Greek island, uh, the island of Kos, which is just off of Turkey, 
in the South Aegean Sea. And this is where science and medicine really have their origins. And of course, it's Hippocrates, the great Hippocrates, uh, who uh, declared our independence uh, from uh, 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 the supernatural, from religion. Uh, Hippocrates, and of course, there wasn't just one person, but a number of people wrote under the name of Hippocrates. And he separated the natural from the supernatural. So one no longer went to the temple, to the priest if you were sick, you went to the physician, the healer if you were sick. Uh, so he really separated, for the first time, medicine and superstition and introduced the concept of the four humors, you know, black bile if you were in a, a foul mood. I love this etching of uh, Hippocrates because here he is separating the natural and supernatural science and religion and they paint it, uh, etch him with a halo over his head. Uh, so he's forever remembered in this way. So Hipp Hippocrates introduces the idea of scientific medicine, but the normal pancreas isn't even recognized for a century later. And it's the Greek anatomist, Herophilus, who describes the pancreas. He also described the duodenum as being 12 fingers long. Um, and uh, he's shown here uh, on your left uh, with Erasmus. Uh, but it looks like a nice guy, but he also was uh, one of the first to perform human dissections in public and probably vivisections in public as well. So the looks will fool you in some people. Um, the term the pancreas wasn't uh, introduced until the first century, uh, and it, the name comes from pan, meaning all, and creos, flesh. And this is probably because, as shown here, the dog's pancreas is red, and so maybe they, they thought it was, uh, had a fleshiness to it. So centuries passed after Hippocrates, and not much was done until the really remarkable uh, 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 man Galen, Galen of Pergamon, who lived uh, between 129 and 216, uh, also known as the physician to the glad gladiators, a title I would love to have. Um, but he really embraced uh, science, uh, uh, the science of medicine. So he would take an animal, uh, cut the spinal cord one way and see what happened, cut it another way, see what happened, cut the phrenic nerve, and, and really scientifically approach uh, human anatomy, human physiology, and human medicine. Um, and really the first to base his conclusions on this uh, scientific experimentation. But the odd thing was, even though he was a great scientist and, and promoted science, he then blocked science. Um, he, as he said, whoever seeks fame by deeds, not alone by learned speech, need only become familiar at small cost of trouble with all that I have achieved by active research during the course of my entire life. So no more need to do any more research. I've done it all, right? And so everyone stopped. And in fact, that's of course what happened. There would be someone reading the Galenic anatomy here and a different person dissecting it. Um, and there was no connection between what was seen and what was read. And I, I love this because if you look at the people in the background, many of them aren't even looking at the dissection. They're talking to each other and, and listening to the readings. As a result, for centuries, uh, we were stuck with Galen's idea that the, the pancreas was simply a cushion for the large vessels in the body. And uh, it indeed took... Uh, uh, quite a while to overcome this. And so there's a wonderful lesson. It's easy to look back in retrospect, um, but in fact, I think it's, it's harder to do than, than it sounds. And in science, we should constantly question our beliefs. Um, Galen blocked this and he blocked advancement. And I, again, it's harder because our beliefs quickly become our facts. And in our minds, it's very hard to separate what's a fact and what's a belief and to uh, constantly question them. So it took almost 1,400 years for anyone to question Galen, an unimaginable length of time. And now we turn to Padua, where much uh, innovation occurred in the 15 and 1600s. And it was Vesalius, the great anatomist, together with the, uh, von Kalkar, the illustrator, who of course dissected the human body, ignored Galenic anatomy, and then realized, oh my God, Galen was wrong. Um, and he wrote this wonderful, incredible book on the, uh, the fabric of the fabric of the human body. Um, and as he said, the, the keystone of Galenic anatomy, that there was a, the Reedy Mirabilis at the base of the brain that changed vital pneumo into psychic pneumo, didn't exist. 
Um, and so, as he said, Galen was deceived by his monkeys. And now for uh, the first time after Galen, Galen starts to be questioned and a new uh, understanding of human anatomy is born. And unlike Galen, the sailors said, don't believe me, dissect for yourself. And indeed, for decades after that, uh, 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 many physicians went around and, and would dissect, as shown here beautifully in Rembrandt's painting. And now look what, what they're doing. They're looking at the dissection, right? They're not just reading a book. They're looking, they're studying for themselves uh, human anatomy. So now the epicenter uh, has moved from the island of Kos north to Padua. And some really remarkable things happen in Padua. And I'll just mention a few as they relate to the pancreas. The first and foremost was Virsung, who identified a duct in the pancreas. And this is his engraving. Uh, you can see the spleen on the right. Uh, here's the pancreas, the duodenum, and he identified the duct. Uh, and so clearly the pancreas can't just be padding if it has a duct. Um, and indeed, if you go to, to the basilica there in, in Padua, you'll see this plaque uh, dedicated to uh, uh, Virsung. But science is never easy. Uh, Virsung wrote to his uh, former teacher, Rielan, telling him of his discovery. And Rielan wrote back, he didn't have the adequate lab supplies, if you will, uh, that he couldn't confirm the findings because of a lack of hanged criminals. So you think you have trouble ordering things from the store here. Uh, imagine the old days uh, uh, for that. But this then raised the fundamental question, if the pancreas has a duct, what is the pancreas making? Right? And so now we go from normal anatomy into physiology. And that's shown here beautifully, where we're going from the dissection of the cadaver down to the study of physiology. And here you see a dog in which the pancreatic duct has been cannulated, and they can then co collect the fluid and see, does it digest bread? Does it digest meat? And what is exactly the pancreas doing? Um, and uh, this, you, you wonder what this poor guy in the bed here is thinking. Like, <laughs> what are these guys doing in my bedroom? Right? You know, it's bad enough. They brought in these animals. They're dissecting a cadaver and my poor dog. Um, so. So now we have this wonderful wave of innovation going from normal to the abnormal, right? So we have normal anatomy, normal physiology. What about the abnormal? And again, in Padua, uh, Giovanni Battista Morgagni, a uh, professor of anatomy there, would examine patients, treat patients, and then do their autopsy, and wrote this incredible uh, uh, treatise, on the, the Seats and Causes of Diseases, the Cetibus, as it's uh, fondly known. And he famously said, Diseases ha disease has its origins in the organs. And so when he would go into the uh, dissecting room, he would say, ubi es morbus, show me the disease, right? You could see it. It wasn't the four humors. Um, instead, it has its origin in organs. Or as he said, symptoms are the cries of suffering organs. Um, and indeed, he was one of the first, if not the first, to describe cancer of the pancreas in 1761. And he described the pain that the, the patient experienced from their pancreatic cancer as just as if he were being torn to pieces by dogs. And I think uh, patients, physicians and oncologists who have treated patients know the pain and suffering that this disease causes. Of course, diagnosis was one thing, treatment was another, and, and one of his descriptions here uh, of treatment, an enormous palpation resulted, which was immediately calmed by the withdrawal of a few ounces of blood from the arm, but soon uh, she became worse again, and one was forced to withdraw the same quantity from the foot, and so this uh, excellent woman came to her end. Um, so we've uh, st obviously still have a long way to go in treatment at this point in time. But now, in the 17th century, medicine starts to expand out of Padua, and anatomic pathology in Germany, and physical examination to France. The French were sensuous, if you will. They, had, they could feel things and hear things and see things. Uh, Laennec introducing the stethoscope in, in Paris. Well, in Germany, they concentrated on microscopic and, and uh, anatomy and pathology. So in Germany, of course, this was led by the great uh, Virchow, Rudolf Virchow who wrote his classic textbook on cellular pathology, the cellular pathology, uh, and importantly said that the cell theory applies not just to uh, normal tissues, but to disease tissues as well. And we all remember from school, omnicellular cellular, all cells come from other cells. Um, and, but Virchow 
highlighted that now it's not just the gross anatomy, but the diseases occur at the level of the cell. And in fact, today, if you think of our classification of pancreatic cancer, it's based on the cell, right? It's based on what we see under the microscope, Virchow's teaching. Here I've just shown nine different types of tumors in the pancreas, the H&E, hematoxin, and stain slide, and you can instantly make the diagnosis with the right training. So it's diseases occurring at the level of the cell. By contrast, in France, they focus on physical exam, and um, uh, Courvoisier uh, was, for example, demonstrated if he could palpate the gallbladder under the rib cage, uh, the massively dilated gallbladder was a sign that the patient had pancreatic cancer. Uh, today we do it with a CAT scan. You can see uh, here on the left the liver, this massively enlarged uh, gallbladder, and you can imagine being able to palpate this uh, through the skin. Uh, Trousseau, uh, also in, in France, uh, described a, a patient with uh, migratory uh, uh, venous thrombosis of the upper and lower extremities and showed that this was often in association with cancer, with pancreatic cancer. And so we know this as Trousseau's sign. Um, and you can see an example uh, here that I downloaded from the internet. Of course, how does Trousseau himself die? He develops the venous thrombosis and recognizes that he himself has cancer. This turned out to be a gastric carcinoma. Um, so another lesson there, be careful what you study, right? Because you may end up getting it. Um, but so now as we move forward, you can see these incredible transformative waves that have occurred. First taking many, many centuries, but then now the pace of change uh, increasing. So Hippocrates, separation of medicine and religion. Uh, Galen, medicine is a science. Uh, normal anatomy with Vesalius. Morgagne, Giovanni Battisti Morgagne, the morbid anatomy. And finally, uh, cellular pathology with Virco. But what's so important is, is that these are transformative ways. They fundamentally change our understanding of disease and things are never ever the same after they occur. Uh, so, you know, you don't uh, after understanding that, that uh, uh, sim uh, symptoms are the cries of suffering organs, you don't go back to the four humors anymore, right? You know that the diseases have their, their sources in the organs. So this is what's going on in Europe. What about in the United States? What's happening in the United States at the time of Virchow? Well, uh, American medicine was, and science was embarrassment. Um, as Harvard's president, Charles Eliot, in 1869, proposed written exams for the Harvard medical students. And the response was, uh, Eliot actually proposes to hold written examinations for the degree of doctor of medicine. I had to tell him he knows nothing of the quality of Harvard medical students. More than half of them can barely write. Of course they can't pass that written exams. So, not much has changed, right? Um, it's, it's, um, but there, there was a change. There was a beacon of light. Of course, this is Johns Hopkins. So in 1893, uh, there were at least 100 medical schools in the United States that would accept anyone willing to pay. They didn't care what training you had. Less than 20% required a high school diploma, not a college diploma. In 1870, a Harvard medical student could pay, fail almost half their classes and still get an MD. And there was only one medical school, School of Medicine, that required a college degree. And of course, that was Johns Hopkins. And Johns Hopkins was not only famous for the high standards, but it, was, it, it, it really founded on the applying science to medicine. So as you know, Johns Hopkins himself died on Christmas Eve, and many people in this room go to Greenmont Cemetery to his grave on Christmas Eve. Uh, he left a bequest of $7 million, which at, the, at that time was the largest gift ever in the United States. And his goal was medical care for the, the, the needy, for the indigent. Um, and he was uh, very interested in medical education, as he wrote, you will bear constantly in mind that it's my wish and purpose that the institution should ultimately be part of the medical school of that university for which I have made ample provision in my will. So here in this, this wording, he's bringing together a hospital and medical school for the first time in the United States. He's suggesting that science should be applied to medicine and patient care. It was really John Shaw Billings, and if you go through the dome, on the, uh, if you're coming from outside, on the left is Johns Hopkins, on the right is the portrait of John Shaw Billings, who picked up on these words that uh, 
that had been written by Johns Hopkins and really established the philosophy of Hopkins. And he wrote, the medical school must aim to turn out a physician who is not only a well-educated physician, but is also trained to think independently and to investigate for himself. So here is science applied to medicine. And the hospital's chief aims were to look after the sick poor and to promote discoveries in the science and art of medicine and to provide the means of giving medical instruction. So here, John Shaw Billings tying together for the first time in the United States, science and medicine. Uh, Billings, importantly, uh, recruited the, uh, many of the first leaders to Johns Hopkins and uh, some wonderful stories. He went to Europe well, where the first chairman of pathology, William Henry Welsh, was studying and in uh, Leipzig in Auerbach's Keller under the uh, painting of Faust making his deal with the devil, uh, Billings made his deal with Welsh and lured Welsh to Johns Hopkins to come and be the first chairman of pathology and the first uh, dean. Welsh was an incredible physician scientist. This was his dream, and, and he was the right man for it. And he established a small lab that is now, would now be, I think, uh, east and a little bit north of the hospital. But I, I love the way this lab was described, because I think it's the way every lab here at Hopkins should be described. A general spirit of research, a fine spirit de corps. Clinicians and laboratory men were living together under circumstances of delightful intimacy. An entire lack of distinction between younger and more experienced resulted in a unique opportunity to grasp a theme. Opportunities to pursue it were equally open to both. He had the ability to, to hear someone describe an experiment or a problem, and then he could immediately define the critical points and key experiments that had to be done. Just a brilliant uh, 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 scientist. And he inspired unconsciously simply by being himself. Uh, so he set the tone in his lab, which determined a tone for the whole institution uh, and this general spirit of research, science applied to medicine. Um, and again, it, research was carried on at the same time as, as teaching, and uh, students were allowed to investigate on their own. Young minds, people who weren't you know, tarnished by their beliefs of the facts, were allowed to come up with their own ideas and question authority. And uh, so Welsh establishes this extraordinary research lab, Science Applied to Medicine. Uh, Billings also recruited Osler, probably the greatest physician uh, that North America has ever produced, the first chairman of medicine. And I love the way uh, Billings recruited Osler. He went to Philadelphia. Osler was a Canadian, but at the time was in Philadelphia. And Osler describes how he was recruited to Hopkins. Early in the spring of 1888, he, meaning Billings, uh, came to my room in Walnut Street. Without sitting down, he asked me abruptly, will you take charge of the medical department of the Johns Hopkins Hospital? I answered, yes. He said, see Welsh about the details. We're to open very soon. I'm very busy. Good morning. And the whole recruitment to Hopkins <laughs> took less than two minutes. Um, no startup package, nothing. And, um, of course, then Osler also set up a fundamentally beautiful tone for Johns Hopkins. Uh, probably most famous, the bedside teaching. And here you can see uh, Osler teaching at the bedside here at Hopkins. But Osler's understanding of patients was profoundly rooted in pathology. And indeed, when he was in Canada, uh, much like Morgagne, Osler would uh, follow his patients on the wards. If they died, he would do their autopsy. And here you can see uh, Osler doing an autopsy in his top hat, uh, nonetheless, uh, in his bare hands. Actually got tuberculosis of his hands uh, from doing this. But having autopsy hundreds of his own patients, he was able to correlate symptoms and signs with uh, the, the underlying pathology. And Osler, of course, is famous for saying the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. Precision medicine a hundred years ago. Right? Uh, the next one recruited was uh, William Stewart Halstead. Um, Halstead was uh, recruited by Welsh, uh, and not by Billings. Um, and like the others, his consuming interest was science, and science applied, in this case, to surgery. Um, how wounds healed. He studied that carefully in the dog lab, in Welsh's uh, dog lab. Um, he promulgated safe surgery, operating slowly and carefully. And I love the story of Will and Charles Mayo, of the Mayo Clinic, coming down to Hopkins and watching uh, Halstead operate. 
and saying, uh, uh, we'll turn to, to Charles. Watching Halstead operate was the first time I ever saw the upper half of an incision heal before the lower end was closed. He was so slow. But of course, that's what you want, right? If you go to a surgeon, you don't say, Doc, I'm in a hurry. How quick will you be? You're like, are you going to be careful? Am I going to wake up alive? Right? Um, but he was a scientist. And so he noticed a, a clinical problem that when they were doing intestinal anastomoses, the patient would do well for a couple days, and then the anastomosis would come apart, and uh, stool would, would be spread into the peritoneal cavity, and the patients would die a terrible death. So together with the anatomist, Franklin Mall, studied the microscopy of the, of the GI tract, recognized that it's critical not to put the suture into the muscularis propria, but to include the lamina propria, where the collagen fibers uh, were, were not uh, arrayed in parallel and came up with anastomosis that held. So a science, finding an important clinical question, studying it scientifically, and then bringing it to improving patient care. So the four doctors, I encourage everyone who hasn't to go to the Walsh Library and, 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 and see them and appreciate their each had their unique contributions to Hopkins. But it's largely because of this the unique basis on which Hopkins was founded that the epicenter of scientific medicine moved from Europe uh, to the United States. So we've gone from Padua to Germany to France and now across the Atlantic to the United States. And I think you can appreciate that if you look at the story of, of the war against pancreatic cancer. So in 1898, uh, Codevilla uh, in Italy performed the first pancreatic duodenectomy. It was not successful. That same year, William Stewart Halstead here uh, resected an ampullary uh, tumor, uh, but it didn't do the, the bigger surgery. Um, it wasn't until 1909 that the German surgeon, uh, Walter Couch, performed the first successful pancreatic duodenectomy. And uh, he has an interesting story because he had seen a number of his patients die from ruptured appendix. And so he did an appendectomy on his wife, shown here, and all of his kids. Now, how does he die? He gets appendicitis, right? He couldn't do his own appendectomy. So, um, but so this early innovation in surgery in Europe, and then uh, in 1929, vitamin K is discovered. And Alan Oldfather Whipple at Columbia University, first as a two-stage procedure in 1935, and then five years later, the single-stage procedure. Uh, so the surgery that, that, to remove the pancreas, it now bears his name. It's called a Whipple resection. Um, it, it probably, uh, no particular reason. He didn't do the most. He didn't do the first. But uh, this is the way history is sometimes uh, written. So now we're in 1940. And about this time, 10 years later, the genetic revolution occurs, and things fundamentally uh, change in science. Right here, Watson and Crick in, in 1953. And now we turn to the genetics and the can and, uh, application of genetics to cancer. And what you'll note is that as genes are discovered and, and progress is made, in pancreatic cancer, Hopkins is lagging behind, five or 10 years behind, as we go through each of these genes. So let's start with KRAS. It's the most commonly mutated gene in pancreatic cancer. Probably 90, 95% of pancreatic cancers have a mutation in the KRAS gene. These genes were first discovered as viral genes that transduced from the rodent genome and responsible for oncogenic properties of RNA tumor viruses. 1967, the Kirsten sarcoma virus was isolated. In, in rats. Uh, and nine years later, Varmus, Bishop, and, and colleagues uh, demonstrated that viral oncogene is a normal chicken gene transduced by the virus, and thereby converting a normal gene into a potent oncogene. And in 1982, uh, uh, mutational activated rash genes were discovered in human uh, cell lines. So 1982, the first discovery of mutant RAS in humans. Six years later, so it took six years for pancreatic cancer to be studied, and uh, Daryl Shabata and, and uh, Perucci first reported this in 21 of 22 cancers. Uh, Scott uh, tells me that actually Murray Cork may have been the first to make this observation, uh, but uh, didn't publish his findings and talked about them. So there's a lesson there for everyone. And if you want to get scooped, that's a great way to do it. Don't publish and talk about it. Um, <laughs> But the first report from Hopkins on mutant KRAS wasn't until 1993. So you see how far uh, behind we are. 
The second most commonly mutated gene in pancreatic cancer, P53, discovered in 1979. Uh, and it wasn't until 10 years later, much because of uh, Burt's work, that's correctly classified as a tumor suppressor gene. Two years later, mutations in, in uh, P53 are described in pancreatic cancer by my friend and colleague Gunter Kloppel from Germany. Um, but the first description of P53 in pancreatic cancer at Hopkins wasn't until 1994, so three years later. So we're far uh, behind uh, the game. Um, and this is where I now come into more present time here at Hopkins. And so I, I, this is a, a talk on history, so I'm going to be careful uh, describing people who are, are currently alive. And as, as Michael Conway said in The Atlantic, history is essentially a collection of memories analyzed and reduced into meaningful conclusions, but that collection depends on the memories chosen. So this, these are based on my memories, and they're incomplete and, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and wrong often. Um, I wanted to focus on two people because they've shifted their focus and so I thought it's uh, appropriate that I should be able to talk about them historically. Um, uh, John Cameron and, and my dear friend Scott. Um, no one's perfect, uh, but these two, through their special character, their leadership, fundamentally changed Hopkins and the war against pancreatic cancer. So let's start with John. Um, and uh, John, as many people know, uh, really revolutionized pancreatic cancer surgery. When he started, the mortality rate for the Whipple procedure was 30, 40 percent. So you'd go, you'd sign a consent form saying, I have a one in three chance, I'm not going to leave the hospital. Uh, John, through his, this sheer determination, uh, perfected the surgery and has done more than anyone in the world. And here's a picture of him doing his 2000th uh, Whipple resection. Um, and here's the, the celebration of the 2000th. He's, I love the only Hopkins could come up with such a nice sign, right? You think we could <laughs> something else than someone writing on a piece of cor cardboard. Um, uh, but he, I think he's done now close to 2,500 Whipples. And what he did was not only uh, improve the surgery, but he wrote about it and promulgated uh, this message. And so here you can see one of the early papers looking at uh, 230 patients who had their Whipple surgery at low-volume hospitals elsewhere in the state of Maryland. And he was able to show, uh, of, of these 230, uh, I think 31 of those patients at the low-volume hospitals died. Had they come to Hopkins, there were only five of them would have died. Uh, so 26 of the 31 deaths were preventable had they come to the centralized hospital where the surgery was being performed. Same for length of stay, same, same for cost. So cheap, less expensive, better quality, better outcomes, and more and more patients started to come to Hopkins uh, for their surgery. And uh, the special qualities, I think, that John brings uh, to Hopkins, one is a, a broad uh, vision and a wonderful sense of history. And I love this photograph of him talking about the first chairman of surgery at Johns Hopkins. You can see John in the foreground and Halstead in the background. But it's this sense of history, appreciating that here at Johns Hopkins, we're in a special place at a special time, and you guys are making history now. And you ought to think, how am I making history? How am I defining my history and the history of this institution? John also brings a tireless uh, dedication and an extraordinary role model. I remember my colleagues uh, Charlie Yeo and Keith Lilmo would complain. I'd go to him and complain I'm overworked, and he would show me actually he's working harder than I am. So he's, you know, he just said, be quiet and you know, keep at it. Um, he demands excellence from those around him, and I think in so doing makes us all better. I think in every department, pathology, radiology, anesthesiology, demanded excellence and got it and improved all of us uh, by doing this. Extremely generous to other departments um, and uh, I think never asked to be added to a manuscript in the entire time I've been with him. And this fostered, this generosity fostered a, a wonderful spirit of collaboration uh, that developed in the team. Um, so, uh, uh, in parallel, Bert Vogelstein is making great progress with colon cancer in the lab. John Cameron is bringing in the surgery volumes, and if you look, I'll show you a graph later how the, the numbers increase exponentially. And Scott Kern is finishing up in Bert's lab, and this really sparked something quite special. 
Um, and I think if we look at the other pancreatic cancer genes, you can see and get a sense of just how special it was. So starting with another gene that's frequently mutated in pancreatic cancer, the P16 gene on chromosome 9P. In 1994, uh, there's the first description of uh, P16 being multi uh, mutated in multiple uh, cancer types. And in that same year, uh, Scott quickly follows and shows that P16 is targeted in pancreatic cancer. So now the, now the difference between time of discovery and the first report at Hopkins is, is almost uh, simultaneous. But Scott made the observation that uh, homozygous deletions, when they occur in targeted gene, are often very small. And so these can be a tool to discover new cancer genes. And so Scott quickly turned uh, uh, his attention to discovering homozygous deletions and used a technique developed by Wiggler at Cold Spring Harbor called representational difference analysis and applied it to, to uh, a tumor and a normal from pancreatic cancer, looking for what was in the normal but missing from the tumor in representational difference analysis. And you can see after two rounds of RDA, he discovered a, a gene, and this turned out to be the breast cancer gene, BRCA2. So the first sequences of the breast cancer gene were discovered here in Hopkins by Scott in a pancreatic cancer lab using a, an important observation of the homozygous deletion, but embracing this very novel technology, RDA, that had been developed at Cold Spring Harbor to study bacteria. And, and, and in this way, BRCA2 was discovered. A year later, again, hunting for homozygous deletions, Scott discovers uh, one of the most important pancreatic cancer genes, uh, SMAD4 or DPC4, uh, for deleted in pancreas cancer 4, locus 4 is how his name, I want him, na him to name it HOP4, for homozygously omitted in pancreas 4, the, so Hopkins would be in the name, but Scott was thought better. Um, and here you can see uh, in this uh, normal, the gene is present and the xenograft completely absent, and we can now stain and show loss of, of this gene in tissues. So now the, the pendulum that switched, we're not following, now we're leading in the discoveries in the field of pancreatic cancer. Scott, if I were to characterize him as a tireless dedication, uh, this, this is true with John. Um, and in fact, Scott wrote a paper, and I encourage you guys to read it, it in, called Where's the Passion? Um, and he wrote it in 2010. And, and here's uh, uh, from Where's the Passion uh, on your right. And uh, 1966 Nobel laureate Charles Huggins discovered the basis for hormonal therapy for prostate cancer of which he said, one works along at the lab bench without haste and without rest. Time has no meaning. These are happy days, one following another, hopefully without end. So great is the delight of discovery. And so I think Scott beautifully capturing uh, or, uh, Huggins' words on where's the passion. Scott, uh, extraordinary uh, and beautiful creative mind that allowed him to make these enormous leaps in discovering these genes. Not afraid to go out on a limb, um, and uh, uh, pursue an area that, that is completely novel and untested. And I think importantly, and uh, if anyone's ever been in a, a conference or meeting with Scott, ask big important questions. You know, if, if, if someone's saying something silly, you know, it's the, the emperor has no, it's not the emperor has no clothes and everyone's saying, oh, that's great. Scott's hand is up and saying, wait a second, uh, there's something really wrong here. Um, he's uh, uh, asked big important questions in a, in a tough disease to study and a voice who's not afraid to speak up and, 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 and out. Um, and like John, I think enormously, amazingly uh, generous. Again, never asked to be added to a paper. He did ask on several occasions to be removed from uh, papers because he said, I didn't contribute enough to justify this. And again, that spirit, I think, is, is what helped make the group so special. So identifying the genes in cancers and then uh, uh, following uh, Bert's model of the precursor lesions uh, in which Bert showed the, the classic progression model for colon cancer with uh, early and late adenomas and the accumulation of genetic events. Uh, then applying this to pancreatic cancer, uh, the precursor lesions, which Sarah mentioned. And actually the first use of the PANIN term, pancreatic enteropathia neoplasia, was in a letter to the editor uh, by my friends David Kleemster and Dan Longnecker, in which they pr proposed this uh, terminology. So in well, 2000, we were all very happy. We've come up with this new uh, uh, precursor lesion and, and the first to describe it. But of course we weren't. 
Um, and in fact, if you go back to the German literature, this is from 1905, a, a description of Swishen form, so in between forms, between normal and cancer. So precursor lesions in the pancreas were known for uh, uh, close to a century before we were to describe them. And this is uh, uh, not uncommon in, in medicine. It's called Stigler's Rule, and I got this from Scott. That, uh, Stigler wrote that no scientific discovery is named after its original discoverer. Um, and Mark Twain, I think, uh, summed it up nicely when he said, it takes a thousand men to invent a telegraph or a steam engine or a phonograph or a photograph or a telephone or any other important thing. And the last man gets credit and we forget about the others. Think about the Whipple procedure, if you will. He added his little might. That's all he did. These object lessons should teach us that 99 parts of a thing that proceed from the intellect are plagiarisms, pure and simple. And the lesson ought to make us modest, but nothing can do that. Um, and of course, uh, Scott pointed out that Stigler wasn't the first to describe Stigler's rule. It had been described prior to Stigler. Um, so these wonderful advances happening, and then of course in 2001 to 2003, the uh, uh, complete sequencing of the human genome changed uh, everything. And now uh, the scale is much broader, and this required uh, team science. I'm just showing some of the, the team here with Scott in the center. Um, and what's quite remarkable, when one thinks of all of the, the major sequencing studies of pancreatic cancer, whether it's the original one here by uh, Jones, Sean Jones, and Bert's lab, the, the International Cancer Genome Consortium, the TCGA, or the most recent, uh, Nick Roberts uh, sequencing the familial, Hopkins has played a critical role in each of these uh, efforts. Uh, quickly, the, I think everyone's familiar, the Jones, the first sequencing of the exomes of pancreatic cancer, an incredible tour de force. This is before uh, one could put things on a machine and get it done overnight. This was Sanger sequencing of over 750 million uh, base pairs of DNA um, in a large series of pancreatic cancers and identifying the mountains. We talked about KRAS, P16, uh, P53, and SMAD4, and all of the little hills, the genes that are mutated in 5, 10 percent to pancreatic cancer. This was followed, uh, I think, close to 10 years later. So you can now how far ahead Hopkins is by the International Cancer Genome Consortium sequencing of 142. And basically, the ICGC just found what had already been found uh, here at Hopkins although they did uh, describe some mutations in uh, slit robo genes. But I love this because it shows the, how unique Hopkins is and rigorousness of what we do. And in fact, if you go to that paper and look at the slit robo genes they describe, and it may not project well here, but some of them are green and some are red. So they're, they're mixing together amplifications and deletions in the same gene and adding them up and say it's targeted in this. I think of uh, something we probably wouldn't do. If a gene is an oncogene, is probably amplified. If the tumor suppressor gene is probably deleted, it's probably not both at the same time. Uh, but you can see uh, less rigorous, if you will, studies. Uh, then the ICGC followed up with genomes, uh, sequencing of the pancreatic cancer genomes in 100 cases, and uh, helped uh, validate the genes that Scott had already described, BRCA2 and Nick Roberts of uh, PALB2. Um, and then the most recent, the sequencing of the genomes of 638 uh, familial pancreatic cancer patients, uh, collaboration with Allison Klein and Nick Roberts. Um, but going back to history and Osler, you know, the greatest difficulty is to make knowledge effective. Have we been effective in applying this and helping patients who are suffering from pancreatic cancer? Well, I think we have. And just to give a few examples, uh, we can safely resect pancreatic cancers. And this is the number of Whipple procedures, uh, or couch procedures, if you want to say it, here at Hopkins. A high volume center is considered to do 16. And you can see early on John Cameron, the sole warrior, if you will, doing it. And now our numbers of Whipple procedures in the 400s. Uh, and the operative mortality rate, I, I think, is now less than 0.8 percent. Uh, so going from 30 percent when started to 0.8 percent for such a major uh, complicated surgery. So we can now safely resect even complicated uh, pancreatic cancers. Today we can quantify risk. 
We can, based on the patient's family history or the, their germline genes uh, that they have, and again, many of these were discovered uh, here at Hopkins, one can uh, identify the, the increased risk that that patient has, quantify their risk of developing pancreatic cancer. So, for example, individuals with familial pancreatitis, uh, particularly if they're smokers, by the age of 70, have a 30 to 40 percent chance of developing pancreatic cancer. They don't, their pancreas isn't functioning, so some of them choose to have prophylactic uh, surgery to have it removed. So when you can quantify risk, you can uh, uh, guide therapy appropriately. When you can quantify risk, remember most of these genes increase the risk of extra pancreatic cancers that can be screened for. So if you have a patient with a BRCA2 mutation that caused their cancer, their children will be at risk for carrying it, and you can save lives by screening them uh, for breast cancer. And in many instances, the germline mutations can guide therapy. And you can see here uh, examples of uh, tumors that arose in individuals that have a BRCA2 mutations melting away with platinum-based uh, therapies. Uh, soon, uh, based on the discoveries here, we'll have an early detection tests, probably a circulating tumor DNA combined with some protein and biomarkers. And um, I, I have to show one patient, and it's, I think it's the... As a pathologist, I can say the only patient whose life I probably saved. Um, and he gives me permission to show him. This is Dr. Collins, who lost five family members to pancreatic cancer. And in 1993, was at a surgery meeting in Maine, heard John Cameron talk and said, you know, Dr. Cameron, I have five family members with pancreatic cancer. Dr. Cameron referred him to our, the National Familial Pancreas Tumor Registry here at Hopkins. Uh, Tom uh, is an active participant. Ten years ago, joined Mimi Canto's CAP study, Cancer of the Pancreas Screening. Came every year for that, and then uh, was found to have the world's smallest pancreatic cancer on screening. This is, uh, you can see millimeters up here. Here's the pa his cancer, here's the pancreatic duct. Completely asymptomatic. In fact, it was so tiny that when Mimi did the endoscopy, she had to tattoo it, mark it, because the surgeon couldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to find it. Um, so a great example of understanding families, early detection, and then Tom just came and visited me last week, five years after his surgery, and he looks a lot healthier than I do, um, doing great and, and acting. Um, I want to leave a, a little bit of time for questions, I want to uh, wrap it up. Um, but just to, to summarize um, uh, these transformative waves of medicine. And since the beginning of, me of medicine has been marked by transformative waves of innovation. These waves fundamentally change the way we conceive of an entire field. In so doing, waves create new fields and make other fields irrelevant. Uh, when they change the way we conceive of a field, there's no going back. Right? There are no more departments of anatomy that I know of. They're now called molecular biology. Um, and indeed, if you were to go back to the island of Kos, um, this is what you would see. It's not a booming metropolis of cutting-edge medicine, but a wonderful place to play tribute to the birth of scientific medicine. Um, in the past centuries elapsed between these waves, right? Remember between uh, Galen and Vesalius, that was 1,400 years. Uh, now they're coming faster and faster and faster. On the crest of a wave, I think it all seems clear and inevitable, uh, only to be changed by the next wave. Uh, there should always be, there will always be more waves. And I think at Hopkins, we are in a really special place and should be the driving force behind these waves. We shouldn't be following the waves of others. We should be the energy that drives these waves. And we should learn from the vision, creativity, dedication, and generosity of John Cameron and Scott Kern and to strive to do something uh, really different, as both of them uh, so beautifully demonstrated. Um, so I wanted to leave with this uh, quotation from the Beach Boys, uh, catch a wave and you're sitting on top of the world. Um, it, I think the war against pancreatic cancer has been one of multiple transformative waves, and uh, Hopkins has play, played such a wonderful, incredible part in generating this most recent wave, and I look forward to the next wave generated by the young people in the audience. So thank you very much. A real pleasure. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, yeah, sir.
we know now that there is a lot of uh, progress in immunotherapy of pancreatic cancer, and that was something that you had not touched on. So I wondered whether you share some thoughts on that. Yeah. So asking about immunotherapy, I tried to avoid things you know I could that are active because uh, obviously immunotherapy incredibly exciting. Um, uh, the in pancreatic cancer, unfortunately, most patients don't respond to checkpoint inhibitors. The one exception is if their cancer has microsatellite instability, but that's only 2 or 3 percent of the patients. Um, so in the vast majority of patients, just with a checkpoint inhibitor, they don't respond. But what a beautiful, incredible opportunity to create a wave and figure out how do you get a non-responsive uh, tumor that's not recognized by the immune system, pancreatic cancer to be recognized and destroyed by the immune system. So I, absolutely, I think one of the next beautiful ways, uh, clearly it's already here, is immunotherapy. Uh, I think immunotherapy for pancreatic cancer has been challenging. The same is true for targeted therapy. Um, I, I would have bet my house on, we're going to identify these mutations in pancreatic cancer. You're going to have your, your tumor sequenced, identify a mutation. You're going to get a drug specific for that. In pancreatic cancer, among the various trials, they're called IMPACT and, and others, uh, zero impact of targeted therapy in over 500 patients who've been sequenced. So it, that's been disappointing. Germline sequencing, as I showed you, wonderfully imp impactful. Um, but so, yeah, there's enormous opportunity still with pancreatic cancer. Too many patients die, too many patients suffer. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so another transformative wave, artificial intelligence or deep learning. And already embracing it in, in radiology with Alan Yuli, who's one of the Bloomberg professors here, applying it to CAT scans. So take a thousand CAT scans, and the radiologist circled every normal organ in the abdomen on every single slice. Uh, uh, and, and Alan has developed an algorithm that can identify the pancreas in a CAT scan better than the human. When there's a discrepancy between the deep learning and what the human, it's the human accidentally circled the inferior vena cava. Um, and now moving on to cancer. And the goal there is to have it run in the background. So when you go to our multidisciplinary clinic, 10, 20 percent of the patients say, you know, oddly enough, doc, two years ago, one year ago, I was in a car accident, I had a CAT scan. And, there, you know, the tumor was missed or it wasn't, you know, just wasn't seen when you go back and look. Now if you have a deep learning algorithm running on your, your, your scanner, it'll pop up and say to the radiologist, I noticed you signed out this abdominal CT on this patient who was in a motorcycle accident as normal, but have you seen this lesion in the pancreas? And the algorithm circles it. So an opportunity clearly in imaging, and we're pretty far along in that. Similarly, in, in pathology, in Myers cytopathology, if you have a solid mass in the pancreas and they stick a needle in it and pull out some cells and you look at it under the microscope, a third of the time you say that's cancer, a third of the time you say that's definitely benign, and a third of the time the pathologist says, I can't tell. So you can imagine now applying a deep learning algorithm to thousands of pathology slides, and then can you help classify the tumors better? So take that one third you can't tell and move it into definitely cancer or definitely benign. So wonderful opportunities with AI. Um, an enormous hype also, and you have to balance the hype uh, versus the reality, but uh, very exciting times. I just wanted to, uh, not to point out an exclusion, but to add to our knowledge base, and that is that it was Mary Elizabeth Garrett uh, basically, Hopkins had raised money and they were able to build a hospital, but they didn't have money enough to start a medical school. And so it was Mary Elizabeth Garrett who uh, asked all the rich women of the, of the United States to donate money, and she raised money forming this woman's board in order to start the medical school. And her stipulations were that they should have a degree to enter medical school, uh, no, no, to, be, uh, to train as a doctor, and number two, that they should include women. So this was a very yeah. No, no, she was, so. yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. She's the one, the driving force. Uh, 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 Gilman and others were worried that no one will come. We'll build a, this ivory tower in the sky and no one will come. But she said, you're not going to get the money unless you admit women. 
have not only a college degree, they had to be fluent in two languages. And I think Osler said that, well, lucky we got in prof as professors, we'd never get in as medical students. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, absolutely many, many people contributed. So on that note, uh, we thank Dr. Ruban, but also we have a small token of appreciation for this wonderful, beautiful talk that you've given. Oh, you. So may I? And where is this? <laughs> and here it is, <laughs> in a beautiful box. I hope I remove this carefully. Would you hold that thing? Okay. And this is a plaque that says, in great appreciation, we present Ralph H. Ruban, MD, distinguished speaker, history of biology and medicine. And if one of you would take a picture, please. <laughs> Come on. <up. laughs> um, she just started a week ago. Yeah, so she's taking a Yeah. Great